Hi, my name is Mandy Ord and I am a cartoonist and illustrator here in Melbourne. I would like to respectfully acknowledge that this workshop takes place as a digital event from my home on the lands of the Kulin Nation, in particular the Wurundjeri and the Boon people. I pay my respect to their elders and to the elders of all communities and cultures across Australia. So in this workshop, I'm going to share my passion for comics, um, in particular my interest in autobiographical stories and uh, getting inspiration from real life experiences. I'll show you through the process of creating a comic from beginning to end and also elaborate on the kind of tools that cartoonists use to create the very distinct stories that they want to tell. So I started drawing and reading comics from a very young age. In fact, I don't even remember when it started. Comics have just always been a part of my life. Um, I was lucky enough to grow up with some adults who saw this interest that I had and they nurtured it by doing things like buying me my very first comic collection. So the first comic that I was really obsessed with was Foot Rot Flats and it tells the story of a, uh, a working farm in New Zealand uh, with lots of different characters. Most of the characters are animals and the main character is a dog who kind of thinks and behaves a bit like a person. Um, I believe that a lot of what I learned about creating my own comics has come from reading comics and repetitively reading my favourite comics. I represent myself in my comics with this one-eyed character. So most cartoonists who write about their own experiences will have some kind of a symbolic um, representation of themselves. Um, because I've been drawing for myself in my stories for so long, the character has really changed a lot over time. She started off um, with two eyes at the beginning and evolved incrementally to slowly have this one eye. And I can't say it was something I really planned, it just sort of happened. Um, and I would get people commenting on how strange she looked and how it didn't like, like it didn't really look exactly like me. And at first I worried that this would alienate people from my stories and I would succumb to the pressure and draw myself with two eyes again. But as soon as I did that, I realized that it didn't feel right. And she was a really good um, symbol of, of who I am. And so it was a really great lesson in sticking to what feels right for you. And if, you know, if the story is compelling enough, people will um, accept your stylic, stylistic choices. Um, so I continue to evolve her and I know that you know, as I age and as I change, she will also continue to change. And it's exciting to think about that. Um, I write autobiographical comics because these are the sorts of comics that I like to read. I was lucky enough that when I discovered comics, there were a lot of different creators writing about their real life experiences using their own very distinct voices. And these were people from all over the world um, and also all over Australia. Um, this, finding these the work of these people validated that um, it was possible to create stories about your own life, about my life, that, um, that, that, that everybody has a distinct experience of being in the world. So the reason that I write autobiographical stories is because these are the sorts of stories that I love to read and I've loved to read for a really long time. Um, I'm aware that there are a huge amount of cartoonists with very diverse voices from all over the world writing stories about their everyday lived experience. And this validates for me that, um, that I can write from my own experience, that I have something to offer with the, the, um, the sorts of stories that I can tell from my own life. Um, also, when I began my practice, I was trying to learn and teach myself about storytelling and I wanted to write from a place um, of confidence and and 
the fact that no one knew my experience better than myself is where that confidence came from and it's something that I that resonated with me and so I made a decision that that would be the main focus of my practice from that point. When I first started making comics um, or drawing comics I wanted to make books. Um, I wasn't quite sure how to go about that at the beginning and so what I did was um, what a lot of cartoonists do and I started to make my own mini comics. So these are small format um, handmade comics um, that usually contain just uh, one story and over the years I've made lots of different uh, mini comics um, and I see these as um, having been a pathway to having an opportunity to publish more ambitious work so um, those that kind of work includes um, Rooftops which is a graphic novel set in Melbourne and is the story of an experience running over the course of one night. Uh, Sensitive Creatures is a book of short stories and my latest book is called When One Person Dies the Whole World is Over and I wanted to try something new so this is a year-long diary comic. Um, not all cartoonists work in the same way. Um, a lot of us will try different things at various stages of our career, um, even in terms of um, drawing up stories. Some, some formats are quite different. Um, sometimes I've worked in multi-panel formats um, and other times I will concentrate on a single panel format where um, I'll work one one panel at a time um, and the tools I use um, are very minimal um, I use this beautiful archival paper called Shoal Shammer um, so this ensures that the work will last and also it's um, really suitable for using ink on um, at the moment I work with a, um, a paintbrush and ink and the other things I mostly use will be a ruler, pencil and an eraser. So really um, comics are a quite incredible medium um, in terms of the, the you know very small amounts of materials that you need to create stories. So for many cartoonists, it's really good to be in the habit of keeping a sketchbook in which to do some doodling and, and writing. Um, doodling is the first step to cartooning. There's something that happens when, the, when your hand is drawing that also activates your mind. Um, doodling is a, is a way to warm up and to get things, uh, to get the energy up and, and to get things moving forward. Um, it's also like, I consider my sketchbook to be a really, um, safe and private space. So I can have the freedom to be messy, to make mistakes, to say whatever I want, um, and glean from that aspects that maybe I want to write a story about. Um, no one will probably see this except for me unless I choose otherwise um, I keep a sketchbook as a kind of time capsule like a yeah like a diary um, I stick things into it like Receipts and ticket stubs and maps of places that I've been anything can go in here um, it's it's like a Yeah, it's just uh, recording, you know aspects of your lived experience um, and also Diaries and sketchbooks are really good resources for, you know, collecting ideas for stories. Um, a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the things that I record, I don't necessarily turn into a story straight away. Um, I will store it in my sketchbook, often for years, until I feel like the time is right to go back and revisit the spark of an idea and then transform that into a, a longer story. Um, 
So there's a lot of valuable resources in what appears to be fairly random mark making. Um, you know, any sort of random drawing or doodle can be the catalyst for a really, really good idea. So the sort of things that make up uh, doodling include mark making, um, drawing patterns, faces, shapes, uh, words, anything that comes out of the um, unselfconscious intuitive act of drawing just for the fun of it. Um, and this is where you know you start to get an idea of your you know your instinctive choices and your personal style. Um, sketchbooks are very useful for recording moments that resonate as being something that could be transformed into story content. Um, it's very easy for a, a, a moment to flash and pass on by and to forget it. And that's very frustrating when you know you had it in the grasp of your hands. You had this, you know, this amazing idea for a story and it's gone. So I tend to record everything quite quickly that, um, that I know will um, serve me well further down the track in terms of story content. Uh, and also being aware of the world and being um, in the moment and and really observing the way people are with each other and things like um, the way people speak to each other and using this for shaping dialogue and having a more naturalistic feel to storytelling. And when you look at what you've decided to record in your sketchbooks, um, it's interesting because um, you get an idea of what resonates with you about the sorts of stories that you want to tell. You know, the effort that it takes to record something shows that it's meaningful and that um, there is a reason behind it, you know, and that is always a good indication of what a story is about. What is the reason why you felt inspired to record it in the first place? I use my sketchbook as a place to think uh, visually and to problem solve and also to work out things like character design and um, play around with all the different choices and options that I have in which to, um, you know, use the tools to tell my story. Um, I make a lot of discoveries and I think that a lot of cartoonists definitely work in this way. My favourite place to doodle is definitely on the phone. I love talking to my friends and family um, and having long phone conversations, but I always need to be doing something like with my hands. So I tend to do lots of drawing. Um, and some of my favorite things that I've ever created come from these conversations and this, um, yeah, this activity. Also watching TV um, is a good place to doodle, waiting at an airport, um, on public transport, um, you know, sitting outside in the sunshine anywhere is a great place to let your mind and your hand wander. So most cartoonists would use doodling and also keep a sketchbook as a really integral part of their, of their creative practice. And even people who say that they can't draw or that they, they don't like drawing um, are active doodlers. I'm sure that you've seen people around you, um, you know, making marks across a piece of paper um, quite absentmindedly. And that is what drawing is. It's, um, it's, it's making marks, it's, it's thinking, and it's using the drawing tool to make an impression. Um, some of the most well-known and respected cartoonists even publish books um, showing their working drawings and their visual thinking processes. And this is really fascinating um, to see how someone's mind operates. Um, so yes, doodling is definitely a very fundamental part of um, being a cartoonist. Okay, so now it's time for you to grab a piece of paper. Uh, any paper will do, A4 paper, scraps of paper lying around or a sketchbook. Uh, you can doodle in any material that is your preference. I tend to like using a gel pen um, and but other things that you can use depending what you like, uh, like colored 
textures, um, charcoal or graphite pencils or a paintbrush with ink. So whatever takes your fancy. Uh, there's absolutely no wrong way of going about this. Uh, this is just an example of some of the things that I just quickly put down. Um, again, textures, faces, shapes, words, letters. Uh, one of the best places to start is right in the middle of the paper, draw a spiral, and then after that, just see what eventuates. Um, so take your time, enjoy the process, uh, just see what naturally and spontaneously occurs. And then uh, afterwards, you can have a look and, and, and maybe be more aware of your, uh, your personal style and the the sort of subtleties of the choices that you've made. Uh, enjoy. So some of the most celebrated cartoonists don't consider themselves to be the greatest artists, but what they are really good at is communicating. Um, you know, their drawing ability doesn't stop them from creating really great comics. Um, the main role of the picture is to, uh, you know, instantly communicate to someone else something specific about the world. So drawings and comics are understood by readers in their ability to be able to recognize symbols. Often the drawings and comics are quite um, simplified and this means that um, that a lot of uh, people from like diverse um, backgrounds understand the language um, inherent in comics. And this is a sort of the symbols that you know you see every day of your life when you're out in the world. Um, the reason that information is visual and simplified is that it speaks instantly and clearly and there's an understanding that happens in the moment. And this is one of the, the main functions of drawing for comics is to have that instantaneous recognition of what's happening in the story. And it's quite powerful. So some cartoonists will stick with the same style um, throughout their journey in comics storytelling while others as their drawing ability um, improves or starts to shift um, their style will naturally evolve into something else so um, yeah it just depends on on the individual what you what your preference is um, you know if I if I'd worried about my drawing ability when I first got interested in comics I probably would never have gone on to be a cartoonist um, because I did have this thing in my head about the way I wish I could draw and then there was the way that I actually could draw um, but what I did is I just um, I felt more of a pull towards writing the story and I figured that the images would come um, and like anything it, it did just take time and practice um, but there was something actually really good about having a limited drawing ability at the beginning because I was forced to think in terms of the most important um, visual uh, references in my comics. I wasn't caught up in the details um, and so everything was quite simplified and that perfectly suits the language of comics. So whatever stage you're at in your drawing ability is the best stage to start with um, and the most important thing is to think about the ideas and also the ability to communicate those ideas and this can be done very very simply um, in a visual way um, so there's nothing that should ever stop anyone from drawing comics particularly drawing ability so images are instant communicators and people from the beginning of time have always used um, drawings to, to show the meaningful things of their lives. Even when you look back thousands of years at rock art and cave paintings, like of pictures of animals, like say for a horse, for example, um, you'll see, you know, in, in, um, in comics, the same kind of imagery used to represent um, the lived experience. And these are, I think this is exciting because these are, these are uh, drawings that 
are still recognizable to humans, to people, even after thousands and thousands and tens and thousands of years. Um, and you can just see how universal this language really is. So because of a person's distinct drawing style, kind of like, you know, like your handwriting's distinct and the choices that they're making in depicting some of these more universal visual symbols, um, this is a sort of thing that um, powerfully connects with a reader on a very personal and sort of intimate level. It's very individual. Um, and that is sort of the gift that a cartoonist brings to their storytelling, is their own unique way of, of doing things. Um, one of my favourite cartoonists, she gets inspiration for her drawings by drawing everything that surrounds her and all the little details. So every object, every every surface. Um, she would probably draw more from observation. Um, other people like myself, we do. I do a mixture of drawing from memory and also um, image referencing. So I'll um, I'll research how to draw something to problem solve if there's any sort of if I'm having any difficulty. Um, even people who've spent many many years drawing um, struggle with some um, aspects of representing more intricate things that are in the world. Um, so when we've got too little time to think, when we draw quickly, that's when we can really tap into this sort of universal shared visual language. It's kind of, it, it reminds me of the sort of language that, that we have when we're dreaming um, and everybody can recognize the, the things that connect us in the sorts of themes and, and images that we experience in our dreams, like a kind of collective visual catalog. Um, so yeah, drawing quickly um, means that there's a, there's a really nice dynamic and, and, and again, an intuitive process that happens with our inherent knowledge of, of already understanding the world in terms of, of pictures. Okay, so this next exercise is about uh, capturing the essence of the thing that you're drawing. And uh, I'll, so grab a piece of paper and this is going to be a timed exercise. Um, the first thing I'll get you to draw is a car. And um, I'll get you to draw a car in, so grab a watch or a stopwatch, um, and I'll get you to draw a car in three to four minutes. Um, so in that time frame, add as much detail as you can uh, and anything that comes to mind. Once that's up, uh, start the watch again, the stopwatch again and draw another car, but this time in one minute. So it's a smaller uh, time frame, so maybe drawing a little bit faster and just focusing on the main um, important details of what a car is and looks like. And then the last one is drawing a car in 30 seconds, so halving that time. And this is where you're really pairing back all the detail and you're focusing on the main elements. Um, and repeat this again, this process of the three different time frames for drawing a castle, drawing a dog, drawing a shoe. It can really be anything. Um, and just try a few different things. Um, afterwards, have a look uh, at what you've done. And there's going to be a drawing that is going to work within the sort of time frame that you've been drawing at that will suit you. So it'll be um, capturing that dynamic uh, in a drawing um, where you don't have too much time to think um, and also looking at the drawing that communicates the most clearly. And you're gonna also have a aesthetic preference. So a drawing that you really like the look of. It's gonna be a combination. So you get a feel for your natural drawing speed um, and that also suits uh, uh, telling uh, stories with pictures. Okay, have fun! So deciding how to um, draw yourself and represent yourself symbolically in a comic about um, personal experience is something that is unique to each person and there are many many ways to go about designing that character. Um, you know, my character, as you, as I've talked about, uh, came from a sort of an evolving process of, um, 
uh, drawing her repetitively over years and trial and error and happenstance and um, just, you know, uh, moving towards whatever felt right in the time of drawing to get to a certain stage and it's quite mysterious really. Um, but I found that over the course of creating my comic that there was a degree of simplification that took place. Her features started to um, get more linear and um, and that's one of the things that cartoonists do is uh, with characters um, there's this recognition that people um, can identify a, a human element in almost anything so even something like an inanimate object if it has if it has um, features that look even roughly like eyes, it's easy to see yourself in that and to project yourself onto it. So a lot of comic characters are very, very simplified for that reason. So there's more of a space for the reader to project themselves into the story and into the life of the character. So representing yourself in a comic as a sort of a symbolic self is um, is very personal and everyone's going to have their own way of approaching it. Um, some uh, some people like to draw themselves and other characters very realistically, so very close to life. Um, so the character is very very particular uh, with lots and lots of detail. Uh, uh, a lot of cartoonists, or most I would say, um, simplify the features of their characters. Um, their faces are probably more linear. Um, their expressions are really easy to read because of the simplification. Um, there's cartoonists who choose not to draw themselves um, as recognizably human at all. They uh, draw themselves as being like a hybrid animal human character. Sometimes they take on um, the the mannerisms of the of the animal and sometimes they're very much human they just happen to look like a mouse or a dog or or a, a frog um, and this is a really nice way to be able to have a little bit of a distance from the the way drawing yourself as you look makes you feel a little bit exposed this is like having a pseudonym you have a someone standing in for you but still telling your real life experiences um, and uh, and a, a, a way to really hone in on the sorts of way you want to represent yourself is to try lots of different things, try a realistic version, try a simplistic version, you know, uh, try a, an animal version of yourself. And also, if you found one that you like, and you'll know it when you see it, um, is to take that character and to draw them repetitively even on the same page draw it over and over and over and over again and make the tiniest little adjustments that will happen anyway and then one day you're just going to have this character that speaks to you as being such a perfect representation of yourself and this can be the the one to to be the vehicle for the stories that you're telling um, but it's a process and it's ex an exciting process and it's it's one of discovery Okay, so I thought it would be great to try a few different techniques to give you a, a, an opportunity to figure out The sort of way that you feel most comfortable representing yourself So it's good to try a few different things and you'll know it when you see it um, So start off maybe for about five minutes or so uh, either looking in the mirror or looking at a photograph or just looking at your phone. Um, spend some time trying to do like the most realistic portrait of yourself that you can. And whatever your drawing ability is now is perfect. So don't worry too much about that. I'll show you mine. Um, <laughs> um, I was in a good mood when I drew that, just so you know, just that's what came out. But yeah, so just... Just see how you go, um, and uh, yeah, about five minutes.
so I often get ideas for stories in the strangest places um, like the shower uh, go for a walk being stuck in peak hour traffic um, through dreams um, and often just ideas that come like kind of like a flash of lightning from nowhere and I'm always really really grateful for when this happens and make sure to um, to record um, these ideas um, as soon as I can in my sketchbook or um, on my phone and send a message to myself or write on the scrap of paper and put it in my back pocket so as not to lose it. Um, but there are ways to generate ideas where you don't wait around for one to come to you that you can sort of manifest them yourself. Um, one of these ways is using things like themes and topics that are broad but that you can bring to your own experiences, your own knowledge and your own ideas. Um, so sometimes I will work from a theme because it's for like a, maybe a commissioned job. Um, so say a theme for example of a fictional female character who is inspiring and that will um, and that's very personal um, but it's exciting because it might be something that I haven't thought to write about before. Often I'll give myself a, um, a theme to work on my own independent work with um, to, just to generate story ideas like uh, I might think of what is the the coldest that I've ever felt. Um, every single person will have had one moment in their lives up until now where they can recall feeling cold, like really cold. And I love that we have all this shared experience, all of us humans. Um, and then um, things like, um, you know, memories, experiences and observations are also fantastic methods for generating story ideas. I often reflect back on my childhood experiences um, and how they shaped who I am today. Um, you know, looking back on a different version of yourself, a younger version of yourself, coming from a point of being um, a, a, a different version. You can, it's almost like you're having a conversation with yourself along two different time frames. Um, and also there's the idea of being like a witness of being someone who when you're out in the world and you're observing the things that are around you but even being even being someone who's purely observing um, you're also a participant in the act of looking um, so that's why I when I'm writing autobiographical stories I include myself in the story because I feel like the pure act of of, um, of seeing is participation so um, personal interests are fantastic ways for a, of generating ideas for stories. You know, write about what you love, write, write about what interests you, what, what you feel, what fascinates you. So words are used in many ways when making a comic. Um, they are used in the planning process in the form of a script and they also make up a vast amount of the content of the actual comic. Um, so just like images, words are there to add an extra element of meaning. Um, they contribute to the story what the images can't do alone. So I consider a script to be like a map. It uh, provides me with enough details to ensure that I don't get lost. Um, there's always a, a destination in sight and it's taking me on some kind of a journey. Um, but we all travel differently, don't we? Some people like their their map to be very detailed and they like to follow it very closely and not ever veering off course. Um, other people like to have a vague sense of uh, where they're going and where they're headed, um, but along the way will be open to exploration and trying new things and going in slightly different directions. Similar to the way scripts um, are used when uh, creating a finished uh, story. Um, so not all scripts are the same. Um, it's very sort of uh, personal how you like to give yourself direction. So sometimes the scripts that I do are really messy, they're handwritten, um, they're written quickly. Other times I'll, I'll invest more energy into putting a lot of detail and direction into them. 
and they'll be more legible. Uh, it just depends on how I feel like working at the time. Um, I always um, make sure that, that I'm committed to the story idea and if the script needs to change in the process of writing it or rewriting it then I will do that to stay with the, the main spark of the story. I, I often need to really love a story before I even start writing it as a script. So even before writing anything down, the story will be like a script, but it's just in my head. It's just in my mind. I'll, um, I'll be, it's like writing the story in your mind and thinking about it over and over and over again and refining it and then putting it down on paper. So if you ever find yourself sitting and staring at the ceiling thinking and you feel unproductive, actually that's a very, very productive space to be in. Um, that's a huge part of the creative process. Um, when I'm writing a script, I tend to not worry if I'm not including every tiny detail that I imagine is going to go in the, in the, in the story, in the comic. Uh, as long as it's covering the most, some of the most important elements, um, because the images, which will be, you know, a huge part of the story are going to contribute all the extra elements of meaning that might be lacking in, in the written word. So as well as uh, words being a huge part of the planning stages of making a comic, they also are a part of the content of the comic. And they, um, they are used in different ways to um, communicate the story clearly alongside the use of um, images and with the use of images. So one of the ways that words are used is with narration. So often narration is told from the character's point of view or it might be told from the writer's point of view or some other someone else's point of view. Um, the narration is most likely going to, going to be positioned at the top of each panel um, and this is so that it is read first. We read comic panels from top to bottom left to right in the same way that we read words on a page. So there is a natural order to the way um, a reader's eye will travel around a panel and um, the, the cartoonist can really structure that to be very very specific. So speech balloons and thought bubbles are containers for dialogue and for the inner thinking world um, that's normally inaccessible of a person or a character. Um, the idea of dialogue is to show how people relate to each other and also imply sound that people are speaking. It really brings a story world um, alive. And um, speech bubbles tend to, and thought bubbles tend to um, float, as you can imagine, and they're usually up higher than a character and there's some reference to them pointing to the, the head or the mouth of the character who's, who's speaking or thinking. Um, they don't always have to be up high, they can be sort of anywhere within a panel. Again, it just depends on the order in which you or the, cut, you know, the cartoonist wants um, the text to be read in. So if the text is to be read first, and that's the most important element that the reader needs to find out about, then it's going to be up higher. Because characters in comics can be seen, a lot of what they think and feel is communicated by the way they use their bodies. This can be done through showing facial expressions, gestures and body language. Uh, the, the characters are constantly reacting to the world around them. Um, they're influenced by things like gravity and cause and effect. So because a comic panel represents a unit of time, the character in the story will be constantly changing as time starts to flow forward. Nothing stays still, nothing stays the same. When thinking about how a situation affects a character, sort of physically, the way they use their body to express themselves, I often use my own experience of being uh, out in the world and of being a person and think about how, how I naturally react to certain things. Um, and I find that we all have this experience and are really, really good at understanding body language and facial expressions and what 
they are communicating in a non-verbal way. Um, some cartoonists will take this expression, um, this non-verbal communication, and they will exaggerate it, and it will be a catalyst for humour and for drama, whereas other cartoonists like to only very subtly indicate some kind of internal emotional uh, state that's shown outwardly with a person's, um, with the character's expression or the way they're holding their body. Um, so either approach just adds to the, the atmosphere of, of a story. So facial expressions can instantly communicate what a character is thinking and feeling. And they can also hide what a character is thinking and feeling. With the tiniest line, um, it's really easy to indicate um, a range of emotional states. All right, so for this next exercise, uh, grab a pen and have a go at experimenting with portraying different uh, facial expressions showing a range of emotions. So anything from being excited to bored to scared to happy, um, anything that you can think of. And uh, notice how just the subtlest shifts in line work on a character's face can change the mood of that character. Okay, so now take some time to uh, experiment drawing your character communicating emotions using their bodies, using their body language, uh, using their hands. So this can be a range of things like imagine a character has um, won something and they're elated and happy or if a character is feeling vulnerable and maybe even cold what they do with their bodies and these are going to be um, responses that you will know and the fact that you know what to do means your reader will also identify causing um, a um, clarity and understanding that will be instantaneous um, and and also you know physically reenact uh, how you imagine the body to be you can you can act it out or look at um, look at like photo references of uh, other people just to get some kind of idea so as humans we're really good at um, making connections and drawing conclusions based on what is presented to us so we all possess this ability to make uh, or construct a whole when presented just with the parts. Um, we constantly struggle to, you know, to make sense of the world around us, um, even when the information isn't necessarily complete. We have this ability to fill in the gaps. So even if we're presented with two panels that are randomly placed next to each other, um, we still strive to make some kind of sense of how they fit together and we even create a story about the relationship that they have with each other. Um, so with comics and using separate panels placed side by side, we're, as a cartoonist, we're relying on the reader to fill in the gap, to construct meaning between two separate things. This means that um, because of the, the way a reader can form understanding and meaning and make logical leaps, um, not every single thing in a, in, a, in a story needs to be presented. Um, you're relying on the reader's shared experience of being in the world to understand and yeah, to fill in those, those gaps of logic. So comics tell their story showing the passage of time through the changes that occur um, from panel to panel. Each panel will, uh, at every shift of time, will show things like a, um, uh, a character in a different position, uh, dialogue changing, environments changing, it's, it is um, about the shifting of time through spaces. And 
so every yeah every panel is going to have some kind of a different composition and a different world within that moment um, the relationship between panels is called panel transition so this is a way to show how the passage of time is moving forward uh, with the with with what you choose to show in each panel you can either slow time down or you can speed it up so some of these panel transitions are say a moment to moment this is where there's a really in tiny change between one panel to the next and this works in a, the same way as slow motion so this slows time right down and then there's uh, action to action which is really between panels capturing the main um, key um, beginning and end um, of an action and this speeds up time a little bit and makes it a bit more dynamic and then there's scene to scene which is where two panels will be in the same scene but showing different points of view between say characters this is used a lot uh, to show diet people talking to each other and to to um, communicate dialogue and conversation and then there's um, there's panel transitions like scene to scene so this is where between two panels there's two very different locations so this is often making massive leaps of time and distance or it can show two places that are very different in exactly the same point in time so there's lots of ways to play around with time and space using the different elements that we choose to put in our panels so taking into consideration all of those different elements that we've gone through that contribute to the process and to the content of a comic I thought that I would um, talk you through my particular process and my process changes over time and it's definitely different to say my process from a year ago um, but I thought um, this could be something that could work for you so the first thing to do is just remind yourself of that raw material that you are developing your story from so from the initial spark which is the postcard which will also have the image on the other side so from that postcard you've written up a, a rough script and the text in the rough script has been numbered and each of the number corresponds to an individual panel the text will work in this case as a narration so the narration will be written on individual panels at the top part of the panel so the script at this point can be used as a place to make decisions and to start to plan some of the extra elements that are going to appear in each panel so it's just like a working space you can just um you know anything that comes to mind dialogue uh, what a character's doing um, uh, objects anything that you that just you have a have a um, you know a spark um, or an idea for write it down and that's what that space is for so this is just to give you this is just to give you a little bit of extra direction and also when you have an idea um, and you write it down in your script like that it means that um, you won't forget um, it's a good reminder so this is your map so um, whenever you're drawing and you get lost in the drawing which is a really good thing uh, and you need to remember where you're going what where you're headed in your story refer back to your script so now it's time to prepare the materials for creating the finished comic um, my method at the moment is to draw up many many panels and I do this with a, uh, a ruler and a pencil and the size that I'm using at the moment is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters but you can draw up panels to whichever size suit you so I'll just show you an example so that's a nice blank panel and I'll draw up many of these and I'll make extra panels just to take into consideration that I might make a mistake um, I I will um, get my materials organized so uh, yeah I'll have my ruler and my pencil and my eraser and I choose to uh, do finished work in um, ink and I use a paintbrush but you might choose to 
have the finished work as pencil or you might want to use colour um, and you might want to use a pen or even a biro. Um, so whatever you choose is fine. Um, penciling, penciling is a really good idea um, in that as a, as, a, as a layer under something like a darker um, material in that you can sort of figure out the panel before um, you put it on the final surface. So with your nice freshly drawn up blank panels, take those and number them from one until however many lines you have in your script. Also make a panel which will be your title panel, which will be the first thing that a reader will see. Um, you've got your narration in your script matching each panel. So write that narration in pencil at the very top and be aware of your handwriting and that the words are very clear and easy to read. Uh, and then start to use a pencil to make choices about all the elements that are going to go in the main body of the panel. So this will often be things that that aren't included in the narration but are important to communicating what's happening in the moment of that of the story. So I've just got an example here which is the narration that I've chosen chosen is the yoga teacher asked if anyone had a funny story to tell. So just to show you an example, you can see that the narration is up the top. It's the first thing that's read. And then below is all the other different bits of information that just contribute more to yeah, communicating. So there's a little bit of, um, it's sort of uh, like, not dialogue, but thought in a thought balloon. Um, we can see where the character is and we can see objects in relation to her in her environment. And just a bit of a snapshot of what's happening in that moment. Uh, so once I've drawn up all of my panels in pencil with all of the narration, um, uh, I'll go back and um, if I'm happy with the pencils and that they're communicating well, um, I'll go back and start to ink in the final layer. Um, at every stage, you're going to be making decisions and making changes and that's really really normal so i often i often do very minimal penciling in my panels because i feel more excited to draw in the moment and to be a bit more spontaneous and that's just my working method whereas some people would prefer to have everything set in stone within the panel and just copy whatever the penciling is um, I see my drawing as more like a performance in that it's more um, like spontaneous and I, I love working in that way. So yeah, you just work in the way that feels comfortable to you uh, and you'll find that as you're drawing up a panel um, and you're in the moment of drawing that your mind will start to tick over into what's going to happen next you'll already be moving forward into the content for the next panel and that will snowball and keep happening the whole way through um, there's this lovely flow that starts to happen um, and this real enjoyment of being in the drawing process so i hope that you really love the as all the different aspects of drawing comics and um, and are surprised by the sorts of stories that you tell using this beautiful combination of words and pictures and I am really looking forward to seeing what you do.